Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we are going to continue the series on western turkey hunting with our friend Chris Rowe of Rowe Hunting Resources. Chris, how you doing? Doing all right. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm looking forward to touching on late afternoon setups on big old nasty gobblers uh, this afternoon. And uh, before we get to that, I wanted to bring up one thing that I think we forgot on the mid-morning, midday setups episode, and that is what to do with your decoys. And I had said that a lot of times I'll either stash my decoys, which, you know, you, they can get stolen, uh, but stash my decoys because I may just want to run and gun with one DSD Jake and one hen um, and, and or take the decoys back to the truck or if I'm going to work an area um, and, you know, just stay put, I'm probably going to let the decoys you know, keep them out in the open area, and if I'm certainly if I'm going to take a nap and and just uh, sleep out in the woods, I am definitely going to keep my decoys up, and I want them in as most visible spot where birds can see from from every angle all around in the most visible area. How about you? Yeah, and I guess for me, I. When we're talking about the decoys, obviously, if I'm going to be setting up in the morning and I'm going to use decoys, I'll probably have a bunch with me. Very, I mean, it's, yeah, if I know that I'm near the truck or if I can stash them and I don't have to, it's not going to slow me down later to come all the way back and get them or whatever, then, yeah, I can stash them or tuck them or whatever. A lot of times I'll just, you see, I, for me, I use the Avian X, uh, the, the Avian X decoys. And so those ones will collapse. I can roll them up. I mean, they're still kind of bulky, but I can roll them up. So if I know that I'm going to run and gun and I'm just going to be covering country looking for birds, most of the time I probably won't set up my decoys because most of the time I'm going to be moving, moving, hear him moving, hear him, he gobbles, and I'm going to be scrambling to get set up and have him come in, or sometimes he's going to be right on top of me and boom, and I just got to park it and slam down and, and shoot him in the face when he comes popping over the hill but if i you know we talked about the fact of you know swinging around the birds and getting set up and if i know i have time to set up decoys and i'm going to let those birds filter in to my setup or i'm just you know i think we talked about taking a nap and you know i just okay i'm going to take a nap here and we'll see what happens well if i'm going to set my decoys up i'm going to kind of do the same thing that i mentioned previously about you know what does the weather look like i agree with you you want to set your your decoys in a spot where they can be seen by any passing birds but the other thing too is you also want to make sure that your decoys are set up in a realistic spot because if it's say again if it's you've got an opening in the the ponderosa pines or whatever or you're on a particular spot of the ridge and it's open well if it's a hot day if that opening is in the sun, well, most of the time in the middle part of the day, those birds are not going to be out in the middle of the open in that hot sun just standing there baking. They're just not going to be. They're going to probably be more in the shade. So if it's a hot, hot day and I'm just going to set up and just kind of cold call and just let birds filter in, hopefully, you know, moving across the landscape, I'm going to pay attention to what the weather is doing. If it's if it's a hot day, then I'm going to put all my decoys in the shade, and I'll have that Jake set out or the full strut decoy, whatever my gobbler or Jake is that you know whatever male turkey decoy that I'm using. I'm going to make sure that that is in the shade, but it's in an open, visible area, just like he would be if he was a real bird. He'd want to make sure that he could be easily seen. But again, I'm going to make sure he's in the shade. And then I can tuck all my hens in tighter, closer to some other cover, because that's probably where the hens are going to be, loafing, preening, doing whatever they're going to be doing. They're they're probably going to be tucked in tighter to some tighter cover. But if it's a cold day, then I'm just going to do the opposite. I'm going to make sure they're out to where they can be seen, but I'm going to make sure they're in the sun. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to tuck my hens probably closer to some sort of cover, where they might be just kind of hunkered down, preening, and, and just doing what they're doing, but I'm going to have that Jake or the gobbler out a ways out in the open 
just so that he can be seen. And quite honestly, a lot of times, I won't even put a hen decoy out. I'll just put the Jake decoy out. Because, he, they, you know, obviously the gobblers that are walking around out there, the real ones, they heard hens. They believe that there's hens. Especially if I have a strutter decoy. All he needs to do is see that strutter decoy out there. Well, he heard hens, so he, he thinks there's hens around. And then he pops over the hill and he sees a, a strutting decoy out there. Well, that bird wouldn't be strutting unless there's hens around. So I, he doesn't need to see, at this point, he doesn't need to physically see hens. He believes there's hens. He heard hens and he sees someone showing off for hens. Well, I need to come in there and beat him up or at least move into his direction and figure out what's going on. So a lot of times, even if I'm running a gun and I do want to use a, a decoy, it'll just be a jake or a full strut. Good stuff there. Um, let's break into late afternoon setups. And uh, Dar will always say that um, he'll, he'll be like, Jay always shoots a bird in the evening. I, I can't get any birds in the evening. Jay always shoots in the evening. And one thing I will say is, yeah, I have some success in the late afternoons because I am one to, at, you know, three, four, five o'clock, I have no problem going somewhere and kind of being in an area where I think the turkeys are or are going to be. And maybe I'll do this from three to four, you know, from four to five. I may sit in two different areas. I may set out a couple decoys. And I may just kind of sit my butt down and I may just kind of call and, and, you know, I may sit there for 30 or 40 minutes and then I may move over five or 600 yards and just sit down and, and kind of prospecting, but kind of just listening and kind of seeing what's shaking and what's going. And in the back of my mind, my whole intention on my evening is not getting a bird that afternoon but trying to be in a place where i can hear birds headed to the roost going to the roost or flying up into the roost and if i have intel from that morning where i heard birds roosted on an opposite ridge and i was able to kind of pinpoint where those birds were and i didn't get a chance to work those birds I may be sitting over there on that ridge, like we talked about in the roosting episodes. I'm going to probably be set up above where those birds were roosted because I know that they're probably going to walk uphill, yep. come out of the bottom and walk uphill and then fly backwards into the tree, or they're going to walk a ridge line to get to the roost tree and then take off and fly horizontal so they don't have to exert as much energy. Yep. I'm going to I'm going to make a stab and set the decoys out in that area where I think those birds were that morning. And I may not choose to set up on the exact birds that say I blew the setup on or say that flew the other way. If I've got a chance, I may pick some other birds that I was able to pinpoint and you know, work a freshie. I may only have the option of hoping that I go back and that the same birds that I just worked the morning before, that may be my only option. Or I could also not have a clue where anything's roosted, and I know that I'm going to loaf around in the afternoon and do some blind prospecting and calling, but I'm just hoping to hear a gobble because I feel like if I can hear a gobble at you know 5, 6, 7 o'clock in the evening, I'm going to have a much better chance of being in a good roost setup for, for the early morning, the next morning. And so I do a lot of loafing, and then if I feel like I need to move, I move. If I feel like I just need to sit, I sit. And I don't know how to explain that feeling. Um, but, you know, sometimes, yeah, when I pick up to move, I just walked away from a bird that's going to be you know, if I just be patient, it's going to be there. If if it's getting calmer and calmer and the wind's starting to die down and it's starting to get, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes before roost and I got absolutely nothing and I just feel it's too dead and I should have heard a bird, you know, gobbling down in the flats or something headed up to the roost, 
I may pick up and walk hard, hard, hard for eight or ten minutes and get in a different drainage and, and try and mix it up. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with it, all of that. Um, you know, I, I, I really think it comes down to, well, a couple things. What if you, let me, let me split it this way. If you, there's one where what you were just, just, just describing is where you know where the roosts are and another situation where you don't know where they're, where they're likely to be roosted. And then with that first scenario, you know, do we go after the same group of birds we worked at morning or do we try to go after another set of birds? The one thing I'll say, I mean, I agree with everything you just said. You know, I'm going to try to get on the same elevation or a little higher than the, the roost is just because most of the time they're going to swing around and they're going to jump from the high ground laterally over to the tree. It's just a lot easier to fly that way. Um, I may not be set up right if I know the direction they moved off in and I am very confident that they are still over in a particular direction, you know, the, uh, meaning they just didn't do a big giant circle. OK, so roost is here. They moved off to the east and I think they're still east of the roost. And so that evening they're going to come back from the east. If that's the case, if I know the general direction that they're likely to come in from, again, because of legal shooting light, at least where I've hunted, a lot of times legal shooting light ends at sunset as soon as that sun hits, the, you know, clears the horizon. Well, those birds may not be actually underneath the roost tree yet or nearby ready to fly up because you still have a lot of light left. They actually may be a couple hundred yards from there but they're still making their way to there. So if I know the direction that they're likely to come from, I may set up 100, 150 yards from the roost tree. And exactly, I just set up and maybe set some decoys out and just be there and, and, and be quiet and wait, or, or maybe set decoys out if they were at least eager to respond to my calls and I don't have any reason to suspect that they want to avoid my calls. Then maybe I'll set the decoys out and I'll just I'll do some calling and, and just low key just make it sound like yep there's some hens up here yep there's birds up here already why don't you guys just come join me? However, I will say that sometimes the best success I've had, especially if I know you know again if we're talking about mountains and you have these isolated little pockets of big mature pines that the birds are always roosting in, man if they're cagey or if they're locked down with those hens and the hens want nothing to do with anybody else sometimes the best thing that you can do is just make like a hole in the ground and, and just sit there and sluice them when they come in make it seem like there's nothing in the world wrong or different than any other night that they come in to fly up so just play it by and ear on, on the birds that you're dealing with go ahead absolutely and and I will say that generally in the four, five, six, seven, you know, clock range, depending on, you know, obviously sometime in early April, it's dark at seven, but by, you know, the end of May, it's still light at seven. So, you know, as that late afternoon progresses, my personal taste is to call and not call excited. I'm just kind of loafing yep. calling. Yep. Kind of a, it, it'll sound kind of like this on a box, just kind of. Just kind of, I'm in the area, I'm going to go up to my roost, uh, everything's cool, I don't want to fight with you. I'm not, and I'm, I'm not going to run over to you. And I'm not going to run to you. If you want to come to me, you're going to have to come here because I'm just scratching away and life is good. Yeah. And I take that approach and I absolutely love late afternoon hunts and I love sitting on a ridge line and I love just calling light on a box call and getting an answer way off down on the bottom and you know what I do? I, a lot of times I don't even answer them. And then I'm just sitting there. I want to answer them. Don't get me wrong. I want to answer them so bad. But I know that that gobbler knows that turkeys roost up there. Yeah. Okay? So I don't answer them. I let them gobble again. And then I say, is he closer? Is he in the same spot? Or is he further away? 
And oh, I want to answer him. Oh, I want to answer him. But I know that he knows better than me that there's a turkey that usually roosts or that's a ridge that I've been finding all kinds of sign. And I know that other turkeys know that turkeys roost up there. So guess what? Nine times out of ten, he gobbles and he's much closer. I might hit him again after he's gobbled two or three times. I might just kind of give a yelp, 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 yelp. Okay, yeah, I'm still right here and I'm going to roost right here. And a lot of times they'll gobble, they'll gobble again, and they'll kind of take their time. And then the next thing you know, they're coming right up the ridge, they're in sight, and they're gobbling, and, you know, it's game on. And it's a, it's a way different approach than what I take mid-morning or when I'm out prospecting where I'm a little more aggressive, a little more excited. This is more of a just, you know, you're going to have to come to me because I'm about to fly up in the tree and I don't want to go racing down the hill. Yeah, I'm not going to go racing I, down the hill. Yeah, and I can't tell you how many times I've had success where they just bam, they're right in your lap. Well, and then the thing is for folks to keep in mind is you obviously got to judge the sunset. You know, you're you're racing. I mean, at that time, and you know, we I think you remember, or I think I remember you saying that you know those early morning hours. It seems like the sun is just rocketing off the horizon. I mean, just the sun is moving so fast. Well, the same thing happens in the evening. It seems like sometimes that sun is just dropping, and we're looking at our watch, going, "Please, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on!" I've got five minutes. No, three minutes. Ah, two. And he's and he's still a little too far away. You know. Play it by ear. I agree with you, but if it looks like he's going to lollygag a little too long and I'm going to run out of shooting light, I might start, you know, stepping it up and getting a little bit more eager and just try to coax him to, you know, put a little pep in his step and get up the hill a little faster. But I agree with you wholeheartedly. Now, the other thing, too. Let's let's take a quick break here real quick, oh, okay. Chris. Hear from our sponsors. Okay, Chris, go ahead. Well, you know, one thing I wanted to say, too, is, you know, in those situations where maybe we've been out all day, the birds have flown down, they're locked up with hens, they flew down, they went the other way, we tried midday, you know, we tried to follow them, couldn't, they vanished. We went out and did some midday prospecting. Man, we know that there's birds around. We found tracks, we found feathers, droppings, whatever. We know there's birds around, but they're just not saying anything. And so you just kind of, you're out there, you're just like, man, should I even stay? You decided, well, I'm going to stay until dark. All right, keep in mind that if you let things go quiet and you don't continually, constantly call, sometimes you can let, if they're not vocal, sometimes you got to remember they might not be vocal simply because there's, you know, whether it's the weather system coming in or a barometric pressure. Always take the temperature of the birds that you're dealing with and also pay attention to what's going on around them. I mean, if the squirrels are chattering and throwing pine cones out of the trees and, and running all over the place and the birds are singing and everything's just alive and moving, well, then weather, re, you know, for, for whatever weather factors there are, it, it's a nice day. Everything's alive. Everything's moving. Everything's awake. Everything's talking. Everything's active. Okay. If the turkeys aren't, then it's probably due to something that's going on with the turkey specific themselves. But if you're out there and it just everything is dead, nothing is moving, nothing is singing, nothing is flying around, well, okay, it just may be an environmental factor. Well, keep that in mind because if you're out there squawking, you know, calling like crazy, well, that's not realistic because the other turkeys aren't doing that. Heck, the squirrels aren't doing that. The, the, the dicky birds aren't doing that. Why is she doing that? So always be cognizant of that. But if you're in those situations where everything is alive, everything is 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 talking and moving, it's a great day, why am I not hearing anything? Sometimes once we get about 4 or 5 o'clock, I'll just shut up. I, I'll put the calls away and I'll just sit on the side of the mountain and I'll just listen. Just be quiet. Because sometimes if, if you just let things quiet down, You'll get the uh, one of those birds will just at one time, you know, maybe an hour before fly up. He'll gobble and he'll just gobble once. Man, if you can, if you're still and you're listening, he might gobble once. If you know where he is and can pinpoint him and you know that, okay, I can get on him, that's where a lot of times I will just, again, just like before, I will flat up. I won't say a word. 
I won't answer. I won't respond. I won't do anything. I hear him gobble. I will get up and I will run my fool butt off and close the distance. Because a lot of times those gobblers will work their way over near where they want to roost. And they'll just wait for other hens to come to them. And so he'll gobble maybe once, maybe twice. But if I can smoke over there, close the distance, and then do exactly what Jay said. You know, get in there, get in close, start to call a little bit. A lot of times, again, you can get those birds to work their way. They're not going to come across the mountain at you. But at the very least, you can get them to sucker their way towards you within range of wherever they're going to roost that night. So... Chris, I'm going to I'm going to categorize myself as a mid-morning, midday turkey hunter that moves a lot, covers a lot of country, runs and guns and is aggressive. I'm going to call myself a late afternoon, early, you know, late afternoon, evening hunter as a pick a spot and listen and observe and be much more still, much more patient and see what's going to happen. How would you categorize your your um, method? I think mine probably... You could... Cat, cat, I, I do both of those, but I think mine kind of follows more with the timing of the season. I, 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 I'm looking at kind of what I've done and the birds I've killed in the past, and early season, early season, I think if I really think about it, I've killed more birds early, early morning, stationary, off the roost, or stationary, set up with decoys, and, and, and there they are, and, and I let the birds kind of work, and I've killed probably more birds in the early morning hours off the roost. Whereas as the season progresses, I think I've killed a lot more birds running and gunning in those midday hours. And and quite honestly, to be to be truthful about it, I always hunt opening weekend. Always. But most of the time I was either working or in college. And so usually I'd have, you know, in, in at least in Colorado when I lived there and you know, if you go out of state, obviously you're you're making an absolute concerted trip. But when I lived in Colorado, most of the places I hunted were a several hour drive away. So I just it wasn't that I could just run out and go turkey hunt. But when I did, a lot of times I'd go opening weekend, see how I do, and if I didn't kill anything, most of the time I would wait until literally like the third week of season, that end of April, third week of third to fourth week of April, depending on how the calendar lied. And I would go and then I would run and gun because, yeah, those midday hunts, I really think those midday hunts are even better when the gobblers, when the hens actually start to lay eggs and the, the gobblers start finding themselves alone or with fewer hens. Or at the very least, the hens are stationary, they're safe in a little particular area and the gobbler feels a little bit more inclined to go and seek a little bit more. So I think those midday hunts are awesome, awesome in that middle part of the season. Yeah, for sure. That, you know, honestly, the, the late season, um, you know, I, I would say, it, you know, off the roost, yeah, you always got a pretty good chance. But then, you know, if you can get out there by, you know, 9, 10 o'clock, because those gobblers will usually follow the hens almost to the nest, and then they're just free, footloose and fancy free. Yeah. And then, and then I think that's also where afternoon hunting in the late season it seems like those hens go to the nest and then the gobblers are off doing their thing and then they kind of all convene yep. back at the roost area. Yep. So that's where that late afternoon, early evening deal where you, if you know kind of ridges where they like to roost and where they like to be, if you're set up there with your decoys and you're, you know, calling and listening and, you know, just, just kind of set in a general area where you think they're going to be, that can be extremely effective because now the gobbler hasn't been by the hen all day. The hen leaves the nest and comes to meet up with the gobbler to fly back up in the tree again. Um, 
ha- have you ever seen situations where hens will stay on the nest all night and and stay stay on the nest or my my perception is that the hens always leave the eggs and come you know roost up in the tree and then come back to them yeah it, Do you e- is there ever a time when they'll just stay on the ground once they start incubating yes what what okay. yeah what as they are laying that clutch, keep in mind people need to realize that they'll lay one egg a day until they get a full clutch. And so that's anywhere of 8, 10, 12, whatever, how many eggs she ever she wants to lay. Um, she will lay an egg every day until she feels she has a full clutch of eggs until she's done. And then once she has a full clutch of eggs and wants to incubate them, then she will stay 24-7 on, on, the, on that nest essentially. But in the meantime. For how many days? Isn't it like 28 days, something like that? I mean, everything biologically is right around 28 days. I mean, if if you ever ask a question of somebody, well, how long is a gestation? Or what? 28 days. It's just. <laughs> but no, I think it is. I think they. I think they incubate for roughly around 28 days or something like that. But um, but yeah, once now while they're laying, they lay that egg. They will go. You're absolutely right. They will. They will roost for the gobbler. They will fly down, mill around. Now, as a, an interesting tidbit. A hen can breed once and store enough sperm to fertilize every single egg that she lays in that clutch. She does not have to breed again. But she will, and she may not even breed with the same gobbler over it. She might breed with two or three different gobblers over the course of that, you know, week to two weeks, to you know, depending on how many eggs she wants to lay. So she will fly down with that gobbler, breed if she wants to, mill around with a group, and then when it's time for her to lay that egg, and if anybody has chickens, they know there are some hens that will lay them in the morning, there are some hens that will lay them at noon, and there are some hens that just by their, biologically, they want to lay them in the afternoon. It it depends on the hen and her cycling at what time of day she lays that egg. But at some point, she's going to get ready to lay that egg, and she's going to leave that group, and she's going to wander off, and she's going to go lay that egg. Once she lays that egg, She's going to mill around there, and then she's just going to slowly work her way back towards the roost or towards the group, if she knows where the group is, later that afternoon. And hence the reason why we talked about before about sometimes those gobblers will, will, if they're found at this point, if they're on their own, they're going to make their way back to the roost site. And a lot of times they're one of the first back, or at least the area around that roost, they're one of the first ones back there because... They're ready to, to get the hens all gathered back up. They're going to be strutting. They're going to be gobbling. They're going to be out there carrying on and, and hopefully attracting and pulling those hens back to them. So, okay, let's talk about um, let's talk about if you well by chance if if you're not able to make it off work and get to your hunting area until let's say one hour before the sun goes down let's say the day before your hunt or before the hunt starts or even let's say the season started and your whole goal is to get birds roosted that night so you have a good chance in the morning to be on a good roost setup there are some times when I will actually cover ground either on foot, on a quad, or in my truck. And it sounds kind of crazy, but it can be pretty effective if you're so so we're we're, we're kind of moving away from actually trying to kill a bird that night. I want to make sure cuz I don't know that we touched on it. In my mind, you can drive that last hour before it gets dark, and you can kind of do the same thing. You can drive, you can stop, you can get out, and you can just go sit on a log for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, five minutes. Just kind of listen. You don't even have to call. Sit there and listen. And then maybe blow a locator call, coyote howl, maybe a crow call, Maybe prospect with your box, but I hate to call and then go start the truck. Yep. But maybe you're just trying to strike a bird, and then you're going to scramble to try and follow that bird to the roost. And I've done it many times where, for whatever reason, I'm out there at 3 or 4 or 5 o'clock, and it, I just get that feeling like, okay, it, this ain't working. Nothing's happening. Nothing's calling. And it just every once in a while I get this feeling that I just I, I need to go and I need to just cover ground. 
I'll get in my truck and I'll just drive. I'll stop. I'll roll all my windows down. I'll sit there and I'll listen. Or I'll keep the windows up. I'll just get out real quietly and I'll just go sit over or maybe just, you know, play with the stick in the dirt. I'm listening. Usually then I'll try a little bit of calling, just trying to strike a bird. I have done that before too, where I strike a bird and, oh, game on. There's still time. And, you know, I've got my shotgun, everything's ready. Boom, I go out there, get halfway to the bird, make a call, make a set, you know, call a little bit. And I've had them where, you know, you come in and boom, you get your bird and it's the most unorthodox, yeah. you know, setup that you've ever seen. I'm going to tell you that I kill way more birds in the evening and I get way more birds roosted if I just pick areas that I think they're going to be in than, than, you know, running and gunning in the vehicle. But I think at times you can run and gun in the vehicle and, and be effective as far as hearing birds and trying to get something roosted for the morning. Yeah. And and if you, and depending on where you are, some of these areas are kind of, you know, if you're, kind of in the backcountry areas or remote or more remote areas, I'll literally, there's times where I'm just, I'm hopping back and forth across a ridge and I'll go up and over on the, you know, say the, the ridge line runs north, south. I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll pop over on the west side, sit, listen. Maybe I'll call a little bit, throw out a locator or whatever. I'll sit, listen, nothing, nothing. Jump back over on the east side. All right, sit, listen, listen, nothing. Call a little bit, maybe locator or whatever, nothing. All right, smoke down the ridge line several hundred, maybe a quarter mile, half mile, whatever. Listen, nope, nothing. Bump back over on the other side. Listen, nope, just and just just flat. covering country, just covering country. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now the other thing too is I, I and I don't want to. I let me say this now so I don't forget it, and then I'll let you head wherever you want to head. Um, it's kind of funny because my my wife would. She enjoys going turkey hunting with me, but she always gives me grief. And and I'm not saying this stereotypically, but a lot of women are get a lot colder than men in the mornings, um, and they might not be. Some women are maybe not as motivated and you know intoxicated by turkeys on the roost in the morning like some of us guys can or diehard turkey hunters can. She would go turkey hunting with me in the morning, and every time she'd be like, oh, just dragging, what, you know, thermos of coffee, bundles up with, you know, all sorts of clothes and stuff to go slug around in the cold. Again, most mountain, at least where I hunt, in the mountains, it's cold in the morning. And so, and we would go, we'd have a good hunt, but, you know, over years, we would always kill the birds, like, between nine and three and she would always beat me up she's like why are you getting me out of bed at 3 30 in the morning and why am i out here freezing my butt off underneath a roost tree when we can just sleep in and go and kill them at 10 o'clock in the morning and i can be up i can have my coffee i can have my breakfast and it, it's warmer and it's more comfortable we need to fit if 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 we want to go with other people, if we're taking kids, if we're taking our spouse or wives or and sometimes wives if you're taking new you know your husbands don't hunt or whatever. If you're taking new people hunting, and especially if you're taking kids or, or those people that aren't just fired up about it yet, don't overlook the success and the benefits of those midday hunts later on in the season. Because they are except they can be exceptionally productive, and they're a whole heck of a lot easier on those new guys or new new guys and gals. Because you can let them sleep in, you can let them get their breakfast. They can take their time getting ready. They don't have to layer up with a whole bunch of clothes, and then you can just take a leisurely hike or a leisurely stroll across the landscape and have a good hunt through the middle part of the day. And it, I'm telling you, you're gonna. You're going to get more people or get more people fired up about turkey hunting if you do it that way than if you just day after day after day you're you're waking them up and dragging them up onto freezing cold mountain at three thirty in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I I think you're right. Uh, I'm sometimes I'm a little hard on people and 
I, I say, if you want to be a real turkey hunter, you got to do it all the time. You can't just cherry pick when you're going to turkey hunt. And I get, I get eyes rolled and all sorts of stuff at me, but, uh, uh, you bring up a good point. Is there anything in late afternoon setups that you think we missed? Um, or do you think we got it covered here? You know, you know, whether you're going to use decoys or not always comes up as a question. And, and that really you have to play based on the birds. Uh, you've got to really take their temperature and what they want to deal with and what stage of the of the seasons you're in. If you know where the roost site is, I mean, or in, in the late afternoon and you know where the birds want to start coming back to, seriously, sometimes the best thing that you could do is just sit there like a hole on the in the side of the mountain and just let them filter in like nobody in the world would even know any better. Because at this point, Sometimes they're they're feeding real quick and they're just trying to fill their crop real frantically before they fly up to roost, and so, but they but they're not overly motivated to engage one another. A lot of times, I mean, they will breed in the evening, but a lot of times they're not they're, they're just not doing that. So even though they want to be with one another, they might not be overly eager to just bowl one another over to where you say you only have like a jake and a hen or a jake and a couple of hens. You might set those decoys out, and that bird is slowly working his way up the ridge, and he gets out there, you know, 80 yards, and he sees the decoys. He may just be like, oh, well, they're already up there. We're They're getting ready to fly up. All right, well, I'm just going to mill around here and just pick, 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 and not, not commit, not come all the way in. Sometimes it's actually better, I've found, in the evenings, maybe not to even put a decoy out, or if you do, just put, like, a hen or, you know, and maybe a feeding hen or a, fan, a hen that's, you know, maybe not – upright but just just put one decoy out sometimes you get to really judge on whether or not you really want to put your full decoy spread out or not now if it's early season uh, yeah I, a lot of times i will i'll put if especially if i'm using a full strut decoy absolutely throw that baby out there because now you are a new guy showing off for the ladies that he's expecting to show up up there and he's like who the heck is that a lot of times they'll come smoking in but that's usually earlier on in the season I think one of the things you can do in the late afternoon setups, if you have that situation where you've got hens and a gobbler and they smoked you right off the roost and went the other way and, you know, never heard another peep from them, but let's say you've heard them in the same spot a couple days in a row, sometimes I'll go right up there where they're going to roost on that ridge and I'll just set a strutter decoy yeah. right there where he's going to be. Yep. And... Just it. I mean, they'll they'll come in and just annihilate that thing because they, you know, it just tears them up. I agree, my friend. All right, buddy. Um, why don't you tell the listeners uh, how they can find you? Yeah, as always, uh, it's RoeHuntingResources dot com. Uh, Roe Hunting Resources. It's R O E Hunting Resources dot com is our website. You can subscribe there for all the educational stuff that we do from elk to, you know, we're talking turkey here, but we've got a lot of elk stuff. Um, and if you do subscribe, if you go through there, um, it's all video-based, so there's a lot of videos to watch. But if you do go to subscribe, when you get to the end, it'll ask for a promo code or a coupon code. Just type in J. Scott Podcast, and it'll take 20% off. But you can follow us on, you know, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and our YouTube channel, but all of those, just it's row hunting resources and you can find us there. And on our YouTube channel, we've got, I don't know how many hundreds of videos on there too, that you can watch. So yeah, absolutely. Awesome, buddy. Thank you for coming on. And, uh, uh, for the listeners out there, we've, uh, covered a lot of ground with, uh, different, uh, episodes with the, uh, the scouting, the roosting, the, the early morning setups, the midday setups, the late afternoon setups, and uh, we're going to talk some calling and uh, decoy setup and placement. Uh, so thanks for tuning in.